Uh, this is Andy Forsetto at the IRIS headquarters uh, office in Washington, D.C. I just want to welcome you all and thank you for coming out to the latest of our webinar series. This is going to be on data access tools for uh, accessing data that's held at the IRIS Data Management Center in Seattle, Washington. And so our speaker today will be Celso Reyes. Uh, just to introduce Celso, he has a PhD in volcano seismology from University of Alaska Fairbanks. Ooh, almost. And, almost. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> and he will be. Uh, he's been at the Iris DMC for um, for about six months. Celso. Actually, I've been here for just over a year. Oh, awesome. Okay. Time passes. Yes. All right. So uh, Celso will be taking us through some of the uh, various tools that Iris has for accessing, uh, accessing data, including the web services tools, which are relatively uh, new compared to some of the existing methods. So just to remind everyone out there, if you haven't been to one of these webinars before, uh, what we'll do is we'll treat this like a typical uh, department style colloquium where uh, we'll have uh, Celso give his presentation. And if any questions come up along the way, uh, I encourage you to submit those on the uh, window panel on the right. So you have a way to uh, type in short uh, questions uh, that we can address afterwards. And so uh, just make them uh, clear and concise. And that will, what we'll do is after Kelso is finished, I will uh, mention who's asking the question and then deliver those to him. And so we can try to work through everything uh, after the webinar. So, uh, I guess the last point I want to make is that this is being recorded, and if uh, if you need to go back and check out something in the video or uh, want to recommend it to somebody later, it'll be posted off of our webinar page, and so that is located uh, located here, Iris Edu slash HQ slash webinar. So uh, I think without further ado, I will pass it over to you, Kelso, and we can get started. All right. All right. There, there it goes. Okay. Let's see. Where are we going to get the screen? All right. Okay. Can you see that? Yep. Looks good. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for tuning into this webinar. Um, as Andy said, I work for um, Iris at the Data Management Center in Seattle. Uh, I'm a quality assurance engineer here and my duties in include testing our services as they come online as well as improving the documentation and, and generating MATLAB content. I'm here today to give you some insight into how the web services can be used to provide data to you as well as your programs and scripts. So while doing so, I will emphasize retrieving the information about the earthquakes, and uh, retrieving seismic traces. So first, I'll start with a general introduction to the web services, answering questions such as what is a web service and what kinds of data do we have available? Then the rest of the talk will focus on getting the data. I'll start by looking at the web services as they exist in the wild. I'll point the browser at a couple of services that will be accessed elsewhere in the talk and do a couple of one-off lookups. From there, I'll delve into accessing IRIS data with the fetch scripts. Now, these command line scripts are particularly useful when you want to provide data to automated systems or to other processes that move lots of data. After that, I'll use our recently released MATLAB interface, IRIS fetch, to do some rapid prototyping and get other quick answers with MATLAB. Let me start by listing some of the types of information that are available from IRIS. So as you can see from the list, there are quite a variety of services available through the web service. Um, you have the ability to retrieve waveforms, station metadata, including various responses, such as uh, the RESP and the SAC poles and zeros. And plus, we also have web interfaces that um, allow you to do other co computations. There's a time series service that actually lets you remove instrument uh, response and do other sorts of filtering and travel times, etc. And we have um, a web interface to the data products area. And here you can find event plots 
global moment tensors, back projections, visualizations, and more. And um, all of these services can be accessed from the link below, but don't worry about jotting that down because there's a, I'll provide a list of links at the end of the talk. Otherwise, this would be pretty, pretty thick with web links. So the services that we'll touch upon during this presentation are the two raw waveform services, which will retrieve the time series data, and the, um, the data select service can retrieve a single seismic trace at a time, while the bulk data select service uh, can take a laundry list of channels and times to retrieve many at once. Now the station service is capable of retrieving the station metadata at a variety of detail levels, and you can get a network overview all the way down to the response information. And then the event web service can retrieve earthquakes, magnitudes with origins and arrival times and more. So these are our web services, but how does one define a web service? Well, web services use HTTP to get information from iris to your computer. Now, what that really just means is that it, this communication happens over the regular rules that govern much of the internet that you're familiar with already. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, here's a schematic laying out the mechanics of a basic web service request and response. So the person or program that needs the data uses a client to make the request. Now the term client refers to any program that can communicate over the web. It could be a browser, a command line utility such as curl or wget, or something specifically designed to work with your services such as the fetch scripts, Python clients, or the MATLAB interface. And you can build your own actually. The uh, programmatic support to build HTTP clients is uh, pretty ubiquitous. Now that client sends a URL to the web service. Now the URL not only specifies which web service to use, such as the event web service, but it also provides information to the web service about what kind of data you'd like to retrieve. For example, were I to ask for all earthquakes with a primary magnitude of eight or more in text format, then the URL would contain parameter pairs such as oh, minimum magnitude equals eight, output equals text, etc. Now the specific parameters will vary from service to service, but you'll see uh, examples of this pretty shortly. Now the web service then interprets those parameters and uses them to figure out exactly which data to retrieve and how to format it so that it can be returned. It sends the information back to the client along with an HTTP header describing the content that's being returned. If all goes well, then the client will get back the requested information, but if not, then you'll get an error message in the numeric code describing what went wrong. So examples where you might not successfully retrieve data include instances where the data is not found or when the web service couldn't uh, interpret the URL parameters that you gave it. Every request to the web service follows this particular cycle. Now, if I've shown you how web services communicate, uh, let's go step by step through some examples using the web services. Now, first up, let's make a couple of queries using a browser. Now, this is the most obvious way to access the web services and should give you a glimpse into the help and tools that are available online to anyone with internet access. Although I'm navigating with a graphical browser, the same results can be retrieved using command line utilities such as wget or curl. Now, for the first example, I like to grab a waveform from a seismometer that's close to an event. I'll use a magnitude and location to determine uh, which event and then find a station nearby. Once I have all this information, then I'll grab a 30-minute uh, waveform. And so the first thing to do is to point a browser at the event service so that we can find our event uh, of interest. 
So here's what you would see in a browser once you arrive at the web services root page. Now each service has a similar page where the detailed usage can be found. Here, you'll find links to information about the service, such as help and a revisions list. There will also be a link to the builder, which is a web form that can be used to generate a query. And then there's the guide that lays out schematically how to use the service. This overview, which appears near the top of every web page uh, of the web services, outlines the parameters of the, that the uh, web service will recognize. And for example, here we see the geographic, uh, temporal, depth, etc., other parameters that it could use. So scrolling down the web page, you would also find example queries. And then detailed information about each parameter. This section of page happens to detail the output parameter, as well as how to search by using either the latitude or longitude boundaries, or by picking a point using a specified radius. So here we are at the event service in our mock-up browser. And I'm doing it this way because it's easier to read than uh, bringing up a regular browser. Um, so let's start our search. So at the top of the screen, of course, you see the browser's address bar. And this is where you would type in the parameters for your search. Now, below that, for the purposes of this talk, I've placed a map that provides some idea as to what sort of data would be retrieved if the enter key were pressed and the search initiated. So I have an oblique view of Washington with a smattering of earthquakes being shown as red dots, with the uh, size of the red dot being proportional to the size of the event. Now, these events are just for demonstration purposes. They don't necessarily reflect anything that's actually out there. Um, so to tell our service that you're looking for data, you use the word query. And that question mark followed by the uh, parameter pairs. So that's the general, that'll be the way to do it generally with the services. Let's start by defining a search area. In this case, we're going to work on creating a, we're going to create a box around Washington, and, and I'll start by typing a minimum latitude. And since the uh, Washington, Oregon border is about 46 degrees north, my first parameter would be min lat equals 46. Now, this would retrieve, if I was to just get the data now, uh, a great many earthquakes, it would retrieve uh, over 370,000 earthquakes. So let's continue defining our search area. When I add the maximum latitude, we've confined the search to a ring, narrowing it to almost 7,000 events. When we finish specifying the longitudes as well, we've narrowed our results to 5,000 events that occurred in Washington. And then finally, we, let's specify a minimum magnitude criteria. And if we were to get the data right now, we'd get 14 events to sift through. So when I actually retrieve the data, I get the XML for 14 events. Now, while complete with details, the XML is pretty verbose and difficult to manually sort through. Its format uh, is pretty good for software to read, though. And here what you see is only one of the 14 events that I've asked for. You can see that it's got time information, location information, authors, etc. But let me put the same information into a more concise output format. So I've added the parameter here, output equals text. Now this re turns results into setting uh, time order. And you'll see columns for event ID, time, latitude, longitude, etc. This information is retrieved from the origins and magnitudes that have been designated as primary for each event. Events may have multiple magnitudes or origins, which you could also ask for. And these types of queries have a many to one relationship um, lend themselves better to the XML format in this case. Um, because I'm not only interested, because I am only interested in the largest event, 
I'll tell the service to order the results by magnitude. And this is done by using an order by parameter. Now, now my event's at the top, and you can see it's a magnitude 6.8. And on the next slide, I've plotted it on a map and listed out the relevant information. Now that I have the event of interest, I'd like to retrieve the seismic data for a nearby station. But first, I have to find out what stations are nearby. So the next stop will be the station service. Now the beha behavior of event and station services are similar. The station service works in much the same way that the event service did. Here, instead of opting for a latitude-longitude slice, I'm going to look for a station that's within a half a degree of the earthquake's location. Now, once again, the actual web page is going to contain all the usage details that you need um, to determine which of these you, know, you can use and how to use it. Now, since I would like to see which broadband channels exist, I'm using a wildcard for the directional code, and uh, thus specifying I want any stations that contain EH channels. There are other parameters, parameters that I could have set, such as network, um, but by leaving them out, I've told the web service to look for any network, station, or location. And finally, I want to be certain that I get station and channel combinations that was, were operating during the earthquake. So here I want to make sure it starts before February 8th and ends after March 1st. Were I to hit enter now, I would get station XML. Again, I just want to be able to glance at the results. So I'm going to, once again, specify text output. Hey, Celso, can I interrupt for just a sec? Absolutely. Yeah, I just got one comment about the uh, sound being a little muted. I don't know if you're, you'd be able to boost it up any, any bit on your end. Okay, let's see if I can. Maybe if I just move that a little. That sounded a little bit louder already. Okay, excellent. Great, thanks. Sure, no problem. Okay, so we have one station nearby. That's super. But before I ask for the data, I need to know more. I don't know what the location code is. And to find this out, I have to ask for more detail. The station service has several levels of detail which can be specified, and by default, it returns details just at the station level. And I would like channel level details. So if I add specify that, level equals channel, now I get it. So now I have everything I need to get my waveform. I know the network is UW, the station is GMW, the location is spaces empty, and the channel codes that match my requirements. I also know the uh, time of the earthquake from my previous entry. So now it's time to get the data. So for this, I'm going to use the data select web service. Except this time, instead of directly creating the URL, I'm going to let the builder do it for me. At the top of most services, you'll see a link to the builder, a URL builder. Now, clicking this brings up a form that I can fill out, which in turn crafts a URL. So this one I'll actually do for real, instead of a mock-up. OK. which is why I did mostly doing mock-ups. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. Okay, so that was network UW. So as I enter information here, you can see that this is changing. The next one I'm gonna change is the station to GMW. G W, that changes. And if I don't understand what these are, there's help available. That shows me how to, you know, what's acceptable. Uh, location, we determined the spaces. We're leaving a channel at BHC. 
and then the time of this particular earthquake was 2001, 02, 28. Having a half hour of data. Hey, Celso, I got a couple yep. comments along a uh, similar path of what I was seeing, which is it looks like if you're updating in your bash, uh, in your terminal window, we're not seeing the changes. It looks like the screen is frozen at that stage. The screen is frozen at this stage. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if that has, let me exit completely out of my presentation then. Okay. And see if that perhaps helps. How is this? Um, do you see? Yeah, you were saying you saw a bash, so I was actually working in a web page this entire time. Oh, so. yeah. Uh, so okay, so that uh, let me um, let me reshare the screen perhaps and see if that'll help. Um, how about now? It looks like uh, that hasn't changed at all for me. It's still. A blank, a white terminal window, basically. Uh, okay. Maybe we might want to trip it up. I we could change the presenter back and forth from you and I real quick, and that might uh, jerk it into finding the right. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, here we go. There we go. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks well, everyone for mentioning. I'm glad it. I didn't. I'm glad I didn't uh, finish out the presentation on that note. <laughs> been along for everybody. All right. Let's try this again. So now you can actually see perhaps what I'm actually talking about. So I brought up the builder that's associated with the data select service. So here's the main page. I clicked on the builder link, and now I get the builder, which is the form that allows me to change the parameters. And as I change them, all it's really doing is it's creating a link that I can then use. I can either copy it straight and click on it or copy it and use it later. And then if there's something in here that I don't understand, there's the help that I can use that describes it. So I will grab the information for the earthquake that I just described um, and for the station. So that was station UW. And you can see it changing. Change these. Change the time, as you can see. I'll continue this. All right. So now we have the link that should theoretically get us the data. And when I click on it, it asks me to download it. And I save it. And voila, we have the uh, Macy data there. So now I'm going to go back to the presentation, assuming that PowerPoint lets me get rid of this. All right. So here again, this is what we did. We asked the event service for a uh, lat long rectangle of earthquakes, magnitude 5 or greater. We ordered it by magnitude and arranged it so we could read it. Then we used the latitude and longitude that we found to craft a query to the station service. And then finally, we combined all that information um, to download the mini seed data. So once again, about the browser, this is a root page for every service that provides both instructions and examples. 
and then you ask for information by using parameter value pairs on the address bar on the URLs. And then most services have a builder, which is a web form that you can use to create the URLs. Uh, builders are especially good for exploring the services while you develop automated access methods. So now that we've explored the services, let's turn our attention to the fetch command line scripts and investigate some of the ways that they can be used to automate things. So yes, what if your data crunching needs are grander? If your processing routine requires highly reproducible data queries or if you require huge amounts of data, then the fetch family of command line scripts might provide the functionality that you're looking for. So fetch event and fetch bulk data are the two workhorses. And as their names imply, fetch event will retrieve information about one or more events by communicating with the event web service. Now, this information is returned in simple ASCII format. Fetch bulk data, well, simple text format. Now, fetch bulk data will retrieve time series using the bulk data select times uh, web service. Now these data are returned as a series of mini seed files. If requested, fetch bulk data will use the station service also to return the metadata that goes with the actual time series data. Let's assume you have a system in place to do some analysis on seismic events. Now this might involve stacking or beam forming or plotting or comparing events or who knows what. An example workflow might look something like this. So when an event occurs, you receive a notice from somewhere, perhaps the NEIC. Or, or maybe you instead um, have a daily cron job, a job uh, that looks once a day to see if there's new events in uh, the IRIS archives. And then if they, either of these things meet a certain criteria, then it triggers a script, which um, then might start one or more processes. So let's say one of these processes happens to require a series of SAC files to do its work. And uh, another one of these processes will then uh, maybe retrieve um, the actual data file based on the event information and a get it the information for a predetermined subset of stations. Maybe there are stations that are a certain distance from the event, but maybe there are stations that all belong to the same network. Either way, the data is retrieved and converted into SAC files, which are then read by your main processing script. This should result in some absolutely fabulous and earth-shaking output. So now, let me show you how uh, the fetch scripts might fit into this. So taking the case that your system looks for an event that meets a specific criteria, we'll once again use the fetch event to grab matching events. And then we'll use uh, fetch bulk data to retrieve the time series and metadata. And then we'll finally stitch things together into SAC using MC to SAC. Let me pop out of the demonstration again at this and uh, get into a demo. Let's see. Okay, we're set. Can you uh, can you see my uh, screen again? The uh, I see a terminal window with uh, terminal window. Yep. Excellent. Fetch bulk data. All right. Yep. Just making sure. All right. So now again, at the end of the presentation, I'll provide the links where you can download these fetch clients that I'm talking about. So when you run the script without um, specifying any options, there's detailed help. And you'll notice that uh, all these options, of these options, they will match the web services web page options pretty closely. So I'm not going to go back into more detail, but you can see that you can specify latitude, longitude pairs, and radiuses, etc. But of note, um, you can also save the original raw XML file. Uh, so now I'm going to build up a query to access a specific earthquake. Now I, 
I know generally when it was, and I know that it was bigger than a 5.0, so let's start with that. So I'm going to use the fetch event. and specify that I want it to have a minimum magnitude of 5.0. If I wanted to specify a range, then I would use a colon and put a maximum magnitude right after that. And because if I was just to do that right now, it would grab a great many events because there are a great many events of 5.0 in the world. Let's specify a start time. And give it that. Okay, now it's already gone off. It's retrieved information from our web service and is now parsing into a format that it can use. And we got still lots of in, lots of events, but then again, we only specify the start time. So this is all the 5.0 events that have occurred um, after April in 2009. So I'm going to take these and I'm only interested, I'm going to do the same event, sa same query, except I'm going to order it by magnitude. Now originally it was sorted by date. Once again, this is just like what we did on the web. Um, order it by magnitude and um, then finally uh, also because it's just going to scroll right off the screen, this is a Unix command that'll just give me the first few lines. Off it is, retrieving those events again. And we should see. All right. Sorted by magnitude, the, the Honshu Japan. Uh, earthquake tops the list, and then we get other earthquakes below it. Well, I'm not actually interested in that particular earthquake. I'm interested in something a little bit smaller. So now I've specified an end time. So we're get just basically this is over the course of a day. Aha, okay. And we can order that once again by magnitude. Interested in this event. Okay, now we take the event that we found and then we're going to use that information uh, in fetch bulk data to retrieve the data from that event. So. I run fetch bulk data by itself. Once again, you see we have all the various options that correspond to the parameters that you would normally use on the web to access these. And including the option, because this is using uh, bulk data, we have the option here to um, pass it a list. So we can specify individually channels and networks and stations, et cetera, or we can give it a list you know, that uh, contains these stations, channels, and start times. So this can be something that's predefined or generated elsewhere and uh, you know, works pretty well with the automation. Um, now the other thing that uh, we're going to take advantage of here when I get the data is I'm going to the metadata also, because I need that in order to be able to create a um, SAC file that would be used. So first I'm going to specify exactly which channel I'm interested in. For now, I'm just going to get um, New Mexico Station. And once again, that was network channel, station, location, start time and end time, which are based around the event. And then I'm actually going to tell it to store the data 
as in a mini seed file is what it would normally retrieve, but I'm naming it. And then also a uh, send out the metadata. That way I can stitch it together once again and get SAC files. So here we go, cross my fingers, and done. So let's see. What do we have? Here's our two data files, the um, time series, the metadata, and now I'm going to stitch them together. using mseed to sac, which is also available from us. And that created the sac file. Okay, so that was just one station. Not terribly exciting in and of itself. But we can also search for um, multiple stations in a network. So for example, um, here let me grab I'm going to grab from multiple networks all the vertical channels that occurred during, uh, we're interested in the same time range. But this time, let's specify a radius. I want it to be within 15 degrees of the earthquake's origin. So the Latin lawn of the event, how many degrees of radius we want. And then once again, I'll just store that in the metadata. Builds it up pretty quickly and retrieves it fairly fast. So we got five channels that it retrieved. And I can, once again, um, stitch those together. We'll see what, what it's actually created. Okay. So we have these three SAC files that are retrieved. Now, I mean, that's how that works. You would want to download it and play with it yourself. Um, but one last thing I really should mention. Uh, you can retrieve 1D or 3D Princeton SEM synthetic seismograms from an event just as easily as you could retrieve the actual data. Now I'm going to use the network SY, which uh, indicates that it's synthetic, and um, a slightly different channel. The MX channel uh, tells me that I want 3D synthetics for whatever direction that is. I could, if I was doing one-dimensional synthetics, I would use LX. The rest of the query is the same. And off we go. So you can see how you, you could actually mix these and get that to work. And once again, I will um, combine them. And there we go. All the synthetics that can be processed right along with the main data. Okay, so um, let me get rid of that now and go back to the presentation. So what can I say about the fetch clients in general? Well, of course, they allow command line access to the iris held data, and they have options that uh, map to the services parameters. and um, the fetch clients and MC to SAC are, well, there's links. I'll, once again, I'll provide the links at the end. And then there's also details out there available for it. So now, having gone through the both the web and the command line, I'd like to transition into accessing data in MATLAB. Now, while MATLAB already has built into it the ability to access web pages, and even has the ability to parse XML files. In most cases, um, interpreting the results would take a lot of work. Um, or, or should I say not interpreting the results, but um, getting it. Uh, yeah, well, yes. Uh, luckily, well, MATLAB also has the ability to run Java commands. 
and can therefore take advantage of the Java interface that was designed to communicate with several of the web services. Now these routines will do all the heavy lifting and will create queries and communicate with our web services and parse out results into Java style variables. But we've created a MATLAB wrapper around these routines that handles all the MATLAB to Java and then back to MATLAB conversions, making it nearly seamless to retrieve data from the web services. This wrapper is called irisfetch.m and the um, both the irisfetch and Java web service library are available to download from our site. So <clears throat> from beginning to to end here, it's going to be all you have to do is you know, grab the irisfetch.m and put it in your MATLAB path somewhere it can find it. And then you're actually already good to go. You can retrieve um, uh, using trace both web forms and the metadata and then plot them. So let's um, go ahead and do that. First I'm going to um, do something a little bit more exciting along the way. I'm going to, rather than bouncing back and forth, I'll describe it. Um, at some point, first I'm going to just show you how it works, but then we're going to plot a bunch of waveforms. We're going to get information for many events, and then we're going to subset those and just do stuff with it. Okay, so here we go into MATLAB. All right. So first thing I already did is I, I have Iris fetches findable to MATLAB. Okay, the command which just asks for um, if you have uh, if you have a uh, multiple files with the same name, or if you just don't know if MATLAB can find a file, if you use which, it'll tell you exactly where that file is. So I was just verifying that I have an Iris fetch uh, that I can work with. So the first example I'm going to do here is getting the traces. Now I going to assume you already know your way around MATLAB if this is interesting to you and that you're familiar with some of the fundamental data types such as the numeric and characters um, and the arrays but a lot of students and researchers don't use um, or aren't familiar with uh, other ways of grouping variables so I'll probably delve into those in a little bit more detail but so here we go this is we're gonna ask for traces and the way this works is we're gonna we need to include the network, station, location, channel information, and these can be wildcarded, and then a start time and end time. So a warning showed up, and that's because I didn't tell MATLAB where I could find the Java library that IrisFetch uses. However, it was smart enough to look online and connect to a version there. Even so, you should download it, and conveniently, the error message tells you where to do that. Okay, but I'll go ahead and add it myself. You would do it when you've downloaded a Java library, which I'm, I know might sound like I'm pulling it out of the air, but this relies on um, a whole set of routines that was were written in Java and they're all bundled together and available from this download space. Um, I've downloaded it and I was going to include it. Well, anyway. This did add it to the thing already, and it worked. 
So notice when I okay, making that request once more. What it gets back to me is a structure. Uh, the MATLAB struct. It's a variable tr whose information is broken out and labeled into what appears to be a bunch of sub-variables. Now these are called fields, and in this case the variable is tr, and contains the fields with network, station, location, etc. And are accessible using the convention the variable with the field name. Okay, so that would get the station name. If I want to get the start time, that would do it. Now, of course, this start time is just a, a number. Uh, MATLAB stores internally, it states as these numbers, which don't mean anything, but there's a routine called date stir, date string, that converts it into something that you and I can read. So in this particular case, in February 27th, Um, going back to the original request, I can get, I can use wildcards. So if I wanted to get all three components, for example, I can ask for that. And it gets me back an array of these structures. And to access the individual parts of those, I would go. So this first one contains the BH1 channel, BH2 channel for the second one, etc. Now one useful feature of storing these data as structs, I can access all the information of a particular type at once. For example, I can get a list of all the sample rates. Okay, maybe that's not quite so exciting because they're all the same. But I could also get, for example, a list of all the azimuths. Now these brackets, what they're really doing is they're telling MATLAB to uh, concatenate the asked for information into an array. And they're sensitive to the size of each item and only work when um, the item has the right number of elements. So it turns out that all of these, um, the, all the three traces that I've retrieved, all have data with the same length, so I can um, join them together and show that we have um, a three by 288,000 um, array of data. So. Um, just probably make it easy here. I'm going to also, I'm also going to get the channel information. I'm using the brackets here because that'll keep them separate. If I was to use braces, if I was to use the, um, I use curly braces to keep them separate. If I was to use brackets the same way, it would just run them all together into one very long word which doesn't do me any good. So now I've already grabbed, I've put all the data in one place. I've grabbed channel names. Let's just plot it and see what happens. So that was it. I'm going to now create a legend for that because Plots are generally pretty useless unless you say what they are. And I'm just passing it all the channels. And it'll automatically create a legend there. So and we're good. There's the three um, components. Now, I used a couple of, let's quit this. I used a couple of uh, different commands, but uh, didn't list them. To find out more about what you can actually do and to get help, you just type help, iris fetch, and I've got detailed help 
that not only gives you examples of how to use it, um, but it links to you know, the other um, <clears throat> the other routines that you can use to retrieve data. So, for example, for the traces, I can do I can ask for that specific routine, and once again, details on how to use it. Network station location, start date, end date. That's the way that we used it before. Tells you you can use wildcards and provides some additional functions that we're not going to touch on today. Only for what I'm going to do next, I'm only interested in having one of those channels. I'm going to keep uh, that. All right. And now I'm going to use the, the Iris Fetch event web service. So I'm going to get help for that. Iris Fetch events. Okay. Once again, more detail how to use it. Basically, with events, you just keep passing it parameter pairs. There's no required um, one. You just keep adding to it. And in this case, I'm interested in getting all the events with magnitudes of 6.0 or greater starting in January 1st, 2010. There we go. I really quickly grabbed them from the... Uh, from Iris, and now it's parsing it out. So nearly 500 events I've just retrieved from Iris. Again, uh, this is uh, a structure. And actually, it's a structure with multiple structures in it, because an event can have multiple magnitudes or multiple origins. So for what I'm going to do here in my next demonstration, let me. What I'm interested in is for plotting purposes. I want to know what the um, latitudes and longitudes are. So I'm just storing those. This allows me to get all the latitudes. So I should end up with 496 latitudes, 496 longitudes when I'm done. And I find out that's true. Now what I'm going to do that I have the latitudes and longitudes is I'm going to see how far this is away from my station. Now recall once again, this is the station I was looking at, ANMO. It also has uh, its location is listed in there, latitude and longitude. So this next command I'm going to use uh, is part of the mapping toolbox in MATLAB, and it'll just retrieve the arc length and azimuth to each of those events. And this little bit is going to be uh, what I'm interested to do, and in, uh, in the end, I'm going to plot all these, but I don't want to plot every single one of them. I'm going to plot a subset. And what this actually will do is this will actually just get me one event for every two degrees of distance. That way, we won't be sitting here any longer than we have to. Okay, so now we're ready for a more complex uh, example. I just All this was set up. Now what I'm going to do first is I'm going to set up a few plots that are going to be um, populated with data that we're going to retrieve from Iris in real time. So that's what, okay. That one, I didn't actually mean to execute that, but that's fine. Okay, what we have here is I was just creating figures, designating that one of them's going to end up being a map, and one of them's uh, going to be uh, just a regular plot. I'm 
created this creates the world map that you see here. Let me move that over so you can actually see it. Okay, this plots a box at the location of our station. This plotted all the earthquakes. I gave it the list of lats and longs, and remember that was almost 500 of each. That's went into plotting all those gray dots. And the green dots <coughs> are the ones that matched our criteria that I'd asked for. These are the ones that are unique to within two degrees of distance, and they are scattered throughout. So these are the ones that I'm actually going to ask for the waveforms from IRIS, the green ones. So this just sets up this spectra plot, and I've just set up some variables for the sake of making the next bit easier to read. Okay. Out of all this, what have I actually done as far as the web services go? The only thing I've done is I've asked for the station at one point. I've asked for a bunch of earthquakes. There's just two calls. Now, hopefully this will work. What I'm going to do now is See if I can keep it from executing right away. <clears throat> I'm going to go through each of these stations, and then I'm going to get the times associated with each of these events, one at a time. And I'm going to retrieve the traces and then um, grab the data. I'm going to plot the wiggles in order here. Actually, I'll just start it now and I'll describe it as it's going. I'm going to plot the wiggles and I'm going to plot a spectrogram. So here we go. It is grabbing each of these in real time from the database. Here we go, degrees away. You can see you can see the phases moving out as the earthquakes get farther and farther away from our station in New Mexico. It's also at the same time plotting the spectra, and you know you can look for patterns in that as well. So anyway, once again, this is just an example of how to um, incorporate our data into something that you might be doing to try to figure out, um, you know, to to figure out your question. So I'm going to let that go and go back to my presentation. So with MATLAB, you can use the Iris WS library. You download it, use the iris fetch together they'll let you access her stuff and you saw it didn't require hardly any um, any effort on my part to do that um, and it supports access to the traces you can also get station metadata and event waveforms or event parameters and uh, this works with MATLAB 2009 and later so these three ways that I've shown you um, you know they're all pretty good for accessing our data quickly. Um, if you've got huge data sets, usually it's better. You can you can download it directly from the browser or you can use the fetch scripts, but MATLAB keeps everything in memory. And the other ones you can you can other uh, the browser and the fetch scripts you can send straight to disk. Uh, if you need it repeatable, then the fetch scripts and the iris fetch, you know, automating also. And if you need to you know, rapidly explore your data and just grab something and see what it's like and then come back and try again. Um, Iris Fetch is particularly good for that. So, I would like to thank you very much for uh, listening to uh, my presentation here. And as I promised, here are some links. And uh, I guess I'll open it up for questions. 
Great. Thanks a lot, Celso. That was really useful. There's a lot of, a lot of ways to parse through data. Kind of dense. Yeah, that it was it's great. It's a huge resource. <laughs> Um, okay, so I, I do have a list of questions. Uh, I would encourage everyone else, uh, if you haven't submitted a question yet and you have one, just, just type it in as we're going through these and uh, we'll have time to get to it. Uh, just a couple, there's a handful of ones that are pretty quick nuts and bolts ones. Uh, Karen Luttrell had a question. Uh, she wanted to know what location, a location code of dash dash meant. I think that's just the dummy version of a location code, right? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, location codes are not used everywhere. They're used often in, the, you know, when you've got a four-hole seismometer, you've got multiple instruments that are in the same place. But um, oftentimes there's no location associated with it, and it's actually stored in the various uh, data formats as spaces. So you can't use spaces in a lot of places, so you use dash dash instead, and whatever the program is interprets those as spaces. Okay, great. Um, I had a question, a question from Glenn Thompson, and he was curious when you were running the fetch event script. Uh, his question was, is it dash dash s or dash s? And he was uh, confused because the help page has it listed as dash dash, but you were using or has it listed as dash s, but you had been calling stuff based on dash dash s. Okay, and the fetch event? In fetch event, uh, I think, yeah. I believe, uh, I, I think that either way might be the way to go. Um, it's pretty smart about that. Uh, let me double check here. Um, and by the way, hello, Glenn. Here it's cold where you're at. <laughs> um, Chad just added that it, it shouldn't matter. One or two dashes will work for both of those scripts. Well, there you go. That's the uh, definitive thank, answer. Thank you, Chad. <laughs> There's a question from Lisa Walsh. She was curious if you could query by radius instead of rectangular area when, we, when you're doing one of these searches. Uh, yes, you can. Most of these... Uh, most of these events. Uh, mo most of these services that do take rectangular can also take a radial. And the one aspect of the radial that I didn't touch on is not only can you do a maximum radius, but you can usually include a minimum radius as well. Excellent. A question from Stephen Golden. When building data queries via the URL builder, for example, is there any easy way to build an accompany, accompanying query for the data list relevant to the returned mini scene data? For the data list relative to the returned mini scene data. Um, well, yes, actually, I guess. If, um, so once you've built up uh, a query, um, for example, for bulk data select, you know, you've used the builder. Um, well, let me back up, actually. I would say that for that sort of thing, maybe the command line utilities are even best, because if you're trying to get the get them to work together, if you're trying to basically download the, the data list and the data, uh, and, and the, uh, so the data list, I don't know if everybody knows that, but the data list seed is just strictly, um, just the metadata information. And then the actual data also usually comes all by itself in a mini seed format. So to get the two together, I mean, that's what I was doing with the uh, fetch bulk data. And so if you're working up something in one of the builders, then sometimes you can actually, if the parameters match, then you can just use those also at, uh, you know, use them and, and feed those into a fetch bulk data. But um, I don't know if I haven't answered that clearly. Feel free to send me an email, and I can try to um, try to clear that up a little bit better. Okay. There was a question from William Harbert about: Can these tools be used to fetch US Array station data for events? Uh, uh, certainly. Right. Um, certainly. Okay. The data for the, you know, the continuous data for much of the uh, 
the US array, the transportable array, for example, exists uh, in our archive. And these tools can, can get at any of that. If you determine what time period you want, you can get it out of our archive. Right, and I imagine that would go for any unrestricted data set in the IRIS archive, which is ah, majority well, that's of the data. absolutely true. Yeah. If you have restricted data, I haven't touched on that. That's another whole ball of wax, except it does work the same. Um, you have to provide um, you know, username credentials, and most of these services have a way for you to actually do that. Great. Uh, there's a question from Karen Luttrell about uh, the irisfetch.m. Would that work in MATLAB if you have it running within a terminal window with the uh, dash no JVM mode? Mm, with no Java virtual machine. I suspect it won't. Um, but I don't, I don't know that for sure. I haven't tried it. Okay. Shahar Barak asks, is Iris planning to make a web service that would also remove the instrument response, such as how SOD operates? Ah, well, actually, there is a web service that will do that. And um, let me actually bring up, I'll go to our, oops, not the event web service, the regular web services. So we have a series of web services. One of them here is the um, is the time series web service. And amongst the many options, what this will allow you to do is this will allow you to retrieve data. Um, but amongst the many options you have include the ability to, where is it? Um, you can correct for instrument response uh, within that service. So then you can you can actually do the corrections here, and then get back um, the corrected data. OK, great. Uh, Chad had something to add about the uh, ability to access data lists, so I'm just going to read what he wrote in. We do not have a service that returns data list seed per se. The equivalent information is available from the web service station services XML. In the future, we will release a converter for turning, turning Excel, XML into data list seed for the users that need this functionality. So sounds like that's uh, on the horizon. Yep, excellent. And, and for those, I, I don't think I introduced it. His, his name was at the beginning, but uh, Chad, is, uh, Chad is my boss here. He's in charge of uh, this uh, the data products web, uh, and web services. So he knows. A uh, question from William Harbert related to what you were uh, presenting within MATLAB. Would you be able to post the .m file that replicates uh, some, of the, some of the commands and steps that you were using to go with the webinar? Uh, and it, he said it was extremely helpful to see that. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I will do that. And actually, if you go to the, uh, if you go to the, oh, let me bring up those links again. <laughs> yeah, if you go to the Iris MATLAB tutorial, there is also um, some examples on how to use the Iris fetch to get our, our stuff. I mean, detailed examples, but I will upload this uh, sample so that you can get to it. Okay, uh, I had a question from Chen Chen. When using fetch scripts in terminal, do uh, do I need to connect to the Iris server by typing any commands initially? Nope, the fetch script handles that, which is part of the beauty of it. Okay, great. A uh, question from Pei Ying Lin: Do we have to specify? the stations or network codes, is there a way we can set them to all stations or all networks? There, does it take wildcards, I guess? Well, I guess that depends on the service. Most services uh, are, maybe not, I would say many services do. Um, there are a few that require uh, the full, uh, that require it mentioned in full, and they are, uh, you know, the full uh, location station network. 
and they're listed. When you go to any of these services web pages, I'll use this as an example because it does have both types. Um, this one, uh, you um, what's required is listed. So anything here when you're going to the query usage, anything in parentheses are required for this particular one. Uh, anything in brackets are not required. If wildcards are acceptable, that'll be listed in here as well. Okay, great. Uh, last question is from Glenn Thompson, and Glenn is curious, does uh, Gizmo Tools waveform load waveform data from Iris by wrapping irisfetch.m? No, actually. Um, it, well, gosh, and the thing, I wrote it. I don't know why I'm pausing. I don't, no, it doesn't. It goes directly to the, um, it goes directly to the, uh, uses the library. So you have to have that Java library, and it'll work with that. But it, it's, um, I wrote that in parallel to the irisfetch.m. So I'll try to keep it so that you don't need both. OK, great. Uh, Chad has one more addition related to the wildcards. The fetch scripts will take all wildcards for network station, location, and channel. But if it's not specified, it's equivalent to all. So, right. just FYI, yeah. All right, so that was uh, that was the extent of the questions. I have a bunch of other comments, but they're all just uh, positive accolades for your talk. I think this was very useful to everyone here. So there's lots of thank yous and uh, great jobs. So I'll, I'll add to that. I think this was extremely useful, and I really appreciate you guys taking the time out to present this. Great, thank you. It was, uh, it was my pleasure. Great. So uh, I think we'll conclude the webinar here. And I just want to thank everyone else out there who took time out of your afternoon to join us. Uh, I know we had to reschedule this because of Sandy. So I'm glad everyone was able to stick with it. And uh, like I said earlier, this has been recorded. So it'll be showing up on the, uh, on the webinar page in a day or two. And I'll work with Kelso to get, uh, if we want to post that .m script, we can include that on the same page as the webinar, just so it's all tied together. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks again, Kelso. And uh, we'll see you all next time. All right. Thanks. Yep.